you're happy to be in God's house this morning. Let the church say amen. Yeah. I said to myself, you know, Lord, 
if you allow for me to get married and have children, I'm going to pray for them all the time, in the good times and the bad times. And so I encourage your mothers to pray continually for your children. And I thank you, Michael, for being here. Uh, I have three sons. They're not perfect, but they're men of integrity and they love the Lord. And it's through the town of prayer. Back row. Oh, Timothy! God's house this morning say amen. 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 In your bulletins, there's an outline if you would open up your bulletin to turn to it and also get your Bibles together. And uh, we'd like you to look with me in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3. We get ready to read the scripture. 2 Peter chapter 3. We want you to look at the word of God. Parents, if you don't know the word, those that can read, let them read along with me as I read. Let's stand to read the word of the Lord together. 2 Peter chapter 3, we're going to start with verse nine, uh, verse 8. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord shall come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you, be, ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God, and speed its coming. The day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new, and a new earth, the home of righteousness. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless and blameless and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. And then here's our key verses. So verse 17. Therefore, dear friends, since you already know this, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of lawless men and fall from your secure position. But grow in the grace. Everybody say grace. grace. Children and young people say grace. grace. And the knowledge of Jesus Christ, to him be glory both now and forevermore. Amen. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we ask that you bless your word to our hearts. May we receive what you say and take it into our spirits that we may be the children of God and live righteous lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So I'm coming at you this morning from the title, Grow in Grace. Grow in grace. When you grow in grace, you're not going to be the same. When you grow in grace, you're going to get to the place where you realize that that's the only thing that matters. When you understand what grace is, when you understand who Jesus Christ is, and you get to the place where you're moving in a place where you're being blessed, and you're moving in a place where the grace of God is coming on your heart, coming on your soul, you're going to be growing, you're going to be moving, you're going to be uh, grooving in a way children, you're going to be able to love your mom and dad better. Adult single people, you're going to be able to love your neighbors better when you grow in grace. We're going to define what grace is to you in a few minutes, but grace is what we need. Grace is that virtue from heaven and that knowledge of Christ that helps us to live each day no matter what happens and say, I am going to live for God no matter what happens. I'm going to put a smile on my face and even when I hurt, even when there's pain in my life, I'm going to continue to walk for God because of growing grace. So this book that we're reading out of was written by the Apostle Peter. Now Peter was one of Jesus' closest friends. And, G and Peter writes this 
to, to warn the Christians and to warn the young people and to warn the children that they would become, that they would become people in their current day situation who would tell lies about God. Okay, young people, children, tell me, what's a lie? When someone lies, what does that mean? Not telling the truth. And so Peter was warning the people all around that there were people who would come in the last days who would tell the truth. Now, many times in Scripture, you hear it says last days. Many times you hear a lot of prophetic leaders say we're in the last days. Let me clarify what the term last days in the Bible means. The term last days doesn't mean that we have another two years before Christ comes back. The term last days doesn't mean we have another five minutes before Christ comes back. The term last days means that, that God has revealed himself throughout time, many years ago, hundreds of years, even thousands of years ago throughout time, and he has spoken through his holy prophets. As a matter of fact, look at verse 1 of 2 Peter chapter 3. It says, Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I have written both of them as a reminder to stimulate to you the wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior, Jesus, through your apostles. And so he was refreshing them that the word of God came through these prophets of old. The term last days means that since Jesus came on the scene, the coming of the Lord Jesus, between now and the time that he comes back a second time, that's the last day period. So the last day started the moment he went back to heaven, he arose from the, he died on the cross, he uh, appeared himself to over 500 people, he ascended on the Judean hillside and went back to heaven. From that point and forward is the last days. Because there were thousands of years before that that God was speaking through the prophets. And so the last days means that the coming of the Lord, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is a central point in history. And ever since Christ came, since Christ came to the planet Earth, that's a time that we need to see a signal and it's pivotal. As a matter of fact, our time starts and ends with Jesus Christ. Because we start with the year of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, after the death. That's where we get AD, it stands for after the death. And so time started, a new clock after Jesus came on the scene. So you and I need to know that these days that we're living in have everything to do with the person of Christ. His coming, his death and his resurrection, and his second coming. And he is coming soon. And soon is an interesting word. Look at chapter... 3 of 2 Peter, verse 8. It says, But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like a day. So God's concept of time, and you and my concept of time, is totally different. When God says a day, it can be a thousand years. So all you need to be worried and concerned about is that God is on his own time schedule, and he may call you and I to live a little longer. Carol Johnson was here this morning, earlier, and we told you that the doctors had given a forecast to Carol that she might have a year too much longer. And so she was in the hospital, and she was moved from the hospital, and she was moved from back to her home, Pacific Health and Rehab, and they said she doesn't have long to live. They even put on hospice watch. And so we were praying for her. And then here she came in this morning, Sunday school class, and wheeled in. I don't know where she is now, but she came in early this morning, and she wheeled into class, and she was... Uh, speaking with us, and she was looking so pretty because the doctors had said her time was at hand and had only at one point given her a few days, and now here we are almost two weeks later, and Carol is still here. Let the church say that. So when men and doctors have an idea of time and think the time is going to look in this way and that fashion, God has another time schedule, and the Bible says that our times are in God. And he decided, well, it's time for somebody to go home and be with us. Let the church say amen. These little children that we have here this morning, young people, children, you're in our service, and I like it that they're here. They're going to make a little bit of noise, but that's okay, because the children are going to grow up. You know, children are sometimes like weeds. Weeds, when you give them a little water before you know it, that weed that started out a couple of inches is five feet high. 
I can remember my dad telling me when we were kids in New York City, go cut that grass in that backyard. He couldn't stand it when that grass started to grow too high. Because if you don't attack the grass in the early part of the season, that grass gets out of hand. These children are growing up fast. They're growing like weeds. And so we're pouring into them the word of God. We're pouring them into them the love of the Lord. And you mothers have done a good job in raising these children in the way of the Lord. Children and young people, let's give mom a hand clap right now. So look in your outline with me this morning. Turn to your outline. And in point number one in your outline, it says, God wants all of his earthly human creation to come to repentance. God wants all of his earthly human creation to come to repentance. Now that's talked about in verse 8. And we're looking at time in that regard. And so I want you to understand why there are, why God is waiting, why God wants us to repent, why God wants the earth to repent, and what we need to be about doing. There are four reasons why. Reason number one is that God so loved the world. You can write that down in your notes. God so loved the world. The Bible says in John 3.16, before God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but shall have. And then in John 3, 6, 3, 16 and 17, it says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God is allowing us to repent. God is allowing the world to repent. And the scoffers, the people who were making fun of, of Peter and the other apostles, they were saying, oh, Jesus said he's going to come back. It's now several years has been occurring since Jesus had left and went back to heaven. And Jesus told the disciples they were coming back. And the disciples told that Jesus might come back next week. So they were telling, hey, you better get ready because Jesus is coming back. When Jesus didn't come back next week, they started making fun of Peter. As a matter of fact, look, at it, look what it says uh, in verse 3, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3. It says, first of all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come. Well, what in the world is a scoffer? A scoffer is a person who shows contempt for others. It's a person that doesn't like other people. It's a person that makes fun of other people. And they were making fun of Christians and they were saying, oh, Christ is not going to come back. He doesn't know what he's doing. And here in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8, he defines the reason why Christ doesn't seemingly come back so fast. Because he's on his own turn time schedule. And because he's waiting for people to repent. And why is he waiting? Over 2,000 years have gone by since he left last time. And why is he hasn't come back since now? Until now? He hasn't come back until now. Because he's waiting for people to repent. And what is repent? Repent means a change of mind. It's a thorough turning from self to God. It's a radical turning to God. It's an experience in which God is recognized as the most important fact in one's existence. And that's why God is waiting. That's why Jesus has to come back. This scripture that I read to you said that the world is going to be destroyed. It says that the heaven and earth is going to be torn apart and that bad things are going to happen. And God is not allowing those bad things to happen because he's waiting for us to see men and women, boys and girls, come to repentance. The second reason why God is waiting for repentance is that we have been commissioned. Write that down, point number two. We have been commissioned. You and I have been commissioned by God to be light and lead people to Jesus Christ. Last week in my sermon, I gave all of us an exciting sign. I said, you're going out this week. I said, you're going out into the workplace, into the business place, into the marketplace, into the schools, into the colleges, and that you were looking for opportunities to share your life. So without embarrassing yourselves, how many of you had a chance to do that? You don't have to raise your hand. But how many of you had a chance to do that? How many of you went and shared Jesus in some way? Remember, I said, you don't have to go and share Jesus just by mentioning name of Jesus, but you can share Jesus by loving them, by being kind to them, by having a nice disposition, even when things around you are not going good, and several of you came to class this morning and out before church and gave your testimonies of how you shared Jesus Christ, and we are in a season as a church, not just the entire come to church, but the season for the church of Jesus Christ worldwide, that's the church in Northeast Portland, Southeast Portland, Northwest Portland, the state of Oregon, the United States, around the world. We are in a season 
of declaring the goodness of God and letting people know that there is hope and we don't have to see destruction and we don't have to see the situation that happened in Cleveland continue to proliferate where those three girls were affected but by our love and by our soul, softening our influence on culture and influence on society and how we treat one another and how we care for each other that these incidences of violence would decrease because the church agreed Jesus Christ rises up and be the church and we make a difference in our world. Say amen. amen. And so the morning that I heard one of the stories about the three women that were abducted for over 10 years. And I'm going to blame Trish on this one. <laughs> Trish and David, he said that one of the one of the police officers came in. The first one ran out of the house. And the second one, the second one, when the police officer identified himself, said, Cleveland police coming in the front. Then when she realized it was the police, that she ran down from the stairs and jumped into his arms. And he knew there was a second one in the house. And he said, Cleveland police, Cleveland police. And when the second one came out and realized it was the police, that she came down from the stairs and jumped into his arms. And he had to put the first one down to hold the second. And my heart just ate with pain. And I just started weeping like a baby in I thought about how in the world, let's think about this for a second, could someone's humanity, this man that did this, be so depraved that he would violate these women in the way that he did, enslave them in the way that he did, and do those awful things? Without being too visual and going into detail, because we're sensitive about the fact that we see abuse occurring in every sector of our society, and even here this morning, some of you have been abused. And what I say to the situations of the world, what I say to the people who are survivors and have gotten through, what I say to would-be people who are filled with things that are turmoil in your hearts and you're doing things that you shouldn't do, what I say to you this morning, clearly, is that you need to grow in grace. And that God has desired from the beginning of time and particularly since Jesus came on the scene, for you and I to receive a measure and a dose of his love that in such a way transforms and changes our lives that the temptations that the devil would come and bring into our thought life are held captive to the goodness of God and to the love of God. And so instead of hating my brother, I'm loving my brother. And he gives me the power to even forgive my brother or sister. Say amen. And so God wants to see his presence to be made known in our communities. He wants to see his presence to be made known in congregations and in cities around the world. And the more that we share the love of Jesus, the more that we take our assignments from heaven, take this assignment that I gave you last week seriously, and go out into the highways and byways and to the circumstances of life and allow God's love to shine in our lives, the more we make a difference and the better our world becomes. Let the church say amen. Amen. So for God to love the world, he was commissioned, point number one. Point number two, and this is all on that first point, that we need repentance. And then point number three, we need to make all of our earthly resources available for the sharing of the gospel. If you love God so much, you care enough to say, Lord, I want to be a giver. My heart and my resources are available to the things and the priorities of God. And I'm going to allow God to bless me, to be a blessing. If you have your Bibles, turn to Genesis 28. And here's an unusual story that occurs where this person was affected by God. And it changed him. Genesis 28 and verse 10. Jacob left for Sheba, set out for Camp Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head, and he lay down to sleep. Interesting story. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth, and with its top reaching to heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord of God, the Father of Abraham. And the God of Isaac, I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. 
Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. All the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you and your offering. I am with you and will watch over you. Wherever you go, I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware. He was afraid and said, the awesomeness of this place. There is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone that he had placed under his head. He set it up on a pillow. He poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. All the young people and children say, Bethel. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear, so I will return safely to my father's house, then the Lord, listen to this, the Lord will be my God and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house and here it is. And all that you give me I will give you a tenth. Isn't that something? When the man of God realized that God was with him and he got this vision that God said he was going to bless him and he was going to use him to be a blessing and that he would provide for him, he opened up his pocketbook, pocketbook and said, God, I'm going to give you a tenth. And so when we give in the tithe and the offering, it only should be as a response to what God has initially done in our lives. We don't want you to be giving and not be giving out of a grateful heart, but we want you to be giving out of a heart that loves God and a heart that is in gratitude for what God has done for you. Let the church say it, Jay. So it says he gave and he decided to give a tenth. And now number point number four, under why... God is allowing for repentance to take place. God is waiting. Every credit, everybody write down, God is waiting. Turn back to 2 Peter chapter 3 and look at what verse 15 says. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. So why hasn't Christ come back? Why hasn't Christ stopped the evil that's going on in the world? Why do bad things happen to good people? God is waiting for people to repent. And you might say, well, Pastor, how can people repent when they seem to be getting worse? How can people repent when they seem to be doing things that are worse and worse? God is waiting for repentance. And he's using you and I to be agents of righteousness. Because God said that he's going to destroy the world because the world has been stained. The very ground that we're walking on has been stained by human blood because of violence and murder. And that's why God said he has to destroy the earth. And it's going to be destroyed this time by fire. So my emphasis on this sermon is not to talk about the details of that destruction, but I am extracting from the text that God is, yes, going to destroy the earth, but that the emphasis of what he wants us to be concerned about is not how and when that destruction takes place. But what we do in the meantime, that people can yet be saved before that destruction occurs. So this is a very strong sermon this morning. It's a sermon of destruction. It's a sermon that God is upset with what happened to those women in Cleveland. It's a sermon that's saying that God is upset when people are oppressed and abused and people take advantage of people. And people, because of the wickedness of their heart, are doing evil acts and God is saying, enough is enough. And just like in the day of Noah, God said enough was enough. God's judgment and wrath was coming on the planet Earth. And you think that God is a God who sits in heaven and just sits there and plays on the, here's the angels playing the little harps, and he's singing all these lullabies, and he's not concerned with the mess that's going on on the planet Earth. Be not deceived. God is concerned about every tear that you cry. God is concerned about every act of violence that's done to women. God is concerned about every wicked thing that happens in prison that's unholy. God is concerned about what happens when someone robs somebody else. God is concerned about someone who gets fired for unjust cause. God is concerned about parents who are not getting good parents. And God is calling on you and I to turn the tide, to turn the situation around, to give people yet another day, another moment, another year, another week by how we live and coming into the vile situations that we 
face and give them the love of Jesus Christ. And for our theme verse today, I'm going to skip down to the end of the text. It's down in verse 17 of chapter 3. It says, therefore, friends, since you already know this, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by error of lawless men and fall from your secure position, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to him be glory both now and forever and ever. Amen. What does it mean to grow in grace? Grace is the undeserved favor of God in providing salvation for those deserving condemnation. And the truth of the matter is, everybody in the room this morning, every child that's above age of accountability, every child under is not, but every child that's above the age of accountability, and every adult is hereby, according to the scriptures, we are all stated to be under the condemnation and wrath of God because sin has gotten into our lives and has separated us from God. And the only answer for for the sin problem, the only answer for racism, the only answer for people who don't treat people right, the only answer for why kids don't get along in school, why adults don't get along with each other, why the economic systems of the world are not right and some are taking advantage of other people, the only answer is the grace of God. And what is the grace? It's the undeserved favor of God in providing salvation for those deserving condemnation. All of us deserve to die. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. All of us have sinned. We all deserve to die. None of us here deserve to get into heaven. And you might say, well, Pastor, what's the answer? What's the solution? Should we all forget about it? Should we all give up? Should we all go home? There's no hope. Because we all have sinned. Oh, but the verse didn't stop there. It says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Grace is the saving activity of God, which is shown in the gift of His Son to die in the place of sinners. And repentance means that we change our minds. We're no longer walking in sin. We're no longer walking in our agenda. We're no longer walking in the flesh. But we decide to have a radical change of mind because we see Calvary anew. We see the cross anew. We see the resurrection of Jesus. And this growing in grace means that every day we need to take another picture, another look toward Calvary. As I'm walking closer to the cross, it illustrates what I'm talking about. Every day I'm walking about my day. Every day I'm living my life. Every day I'm doing what I need to do. But when I grow in grace, I look at the cross anew and afresh. You know, at first when I got saved at age 12, my view of Calvary was only this far and this deep. But as I've gotten just a year older, my view of Calvary has increased and I understand that God loved me, David, so much. Even though I used to, even though I used to be a tattletale, and I would tell on my sister Deborah when she was doing dirt, and I wasn't a good brother, God could forgive me because he loved me so much. That's a private joke. Deborah knows what I'm talking about. She didn't like me when I was a tattletale. And I used to run to dad and say, oh, dad was doing this, daddy. I was a tattletale. Then over and over, I realized that God loves me. As I get older and older, and as I grow in grace, I realize that his love keeps me. As I've committed a few sins in my life, and I get closer and closer to Jesus, I realize that the issue is not my sin, but the issue is his love in spite of my sin. And as I get closer and closer to Jesus, young girl, sometimes I just lay my head on the foot of the cross and realize that I didn't deserve it, and that he did it for me. Even though I didn't deserve it. And as I get closer to the cross and I embrace the cross, I realize that in this life, I'm going to have to suffer a little bit, young people. And I realize that even though I didn't do anything to deserve it, I'm going to have to suffer, and I'm willing to suffer for the cause of Christ. And if my suffering can lead somebody closer to Christ, I am willing to do it. And as I prostrate myself, that means to lower myself entirely in front of the cross, and I bow in before Jesus, my Lord and Savior, I realize that I have a hope and that I have a future, and that one day, just like Christ rose from the dead, I'm going to be changed from my body, and I'm going to be given a new body, and I'm going to see Jesus forever and ever in heaven. And this momentary journey called earth is a short 
span of time in comparison to the magnitude and the greatness of eternity to be able to save and that love me where there will be no more war, no more racism, no more violence, no more acts of meanness and insensitivity. But there's going to be peace and joy everlasting. So get back to the text this morning. God said, I'm not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And he's waiting for you and I to get busy and to share with others. So in light of the fact that he's coming back, what should we do about it? Point number two says, live holy in God's lives. And then point number three says, grow in the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Your view and your understanding of grace gets bigger and better every day you live. So as you go today and celebrate a meal, celebrate moms, have a good time with each other, know that the grace of God sustains you. No matter what's ahead of you this week, some of you may have some tough weeks, some of you may have the best week of your lives, I don't know. I'm not a predictor of time and I can't say what's going to happen to you, but this one thing I know, the grace of God will sustain you and be with you. His grace is, is his unmerited favor. His grace is his love. His grace is his care that surrounds all of us that will be with you as you go through your stuff. And I want you to take the mission this week, to take the commission of Jesus, the great commission and the great command. The great commission is in Matthew uh, 28 and 19 when he says to go and make disciples. The great commandment is Matthew 22, 37 when he says to love God and love your neighbor. And as you go in Jesus' name, as you go abiding by his word, as you go receiving his grace and growing in the knowledge of what he's done for you, it radically changes your life. And so it helps you to love your wife, to love your husband, to love your children, to love that neighbor that's me, to love your friend, to love your relative, even when they're unloved. Because grace came and got you when you are unloved. So I'm going to stay in the gap, and I'm going to be a gracious son and a gracious daughter of God, so that this gospel can be made known to men, and so that people won't have to perish, but that they will have eternal life and abundant life. Eternal life is the thereafter, abundant life is the now. Some accuse Christianity of being a pie-in-the-sky religion, oh, it's only when you get to heaven that good things are going to happen. No. If you live for God and righteousness and truth now, you can see the blessings of God coming into your life, multiplied one after the other. You're going to see God's provision. You're going to see God's mercy. You're going to see God's grace. And you're going to be fulfilled in your inner person so that you can be the person that God wants you to be. Shall we stand?